Good morning, everyone, and welcome to First Five. I'm Pastor Steve, and my goal today is to help you get your day off to a great start. We do that by spending a little time together in the Word of God and in prayer. And so we have now for a few weeks been working our way through Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. And today we come to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And so my hope would be that when we are all done, you would take a few moments and read the whole of 1 Corinthians 15. But for the purposes of our lesson, we're going to read just a portion of it. We're going to look at verses 3 through 9. And so if you have a Bible handy or if you want to pull it up on your phone, I would invite you to join me in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 beginning in verse 3. Here Paul writes, For what I received I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. This opening section is prelude or preface to what is about to come. Throughout the rest of this chapter, Paul is putting forth a compelling, a strong argument for the real and true bodily resurrection of Jesus. Apparently, there were some in Corinth who had begun to deny the literal resurrection of Jesus. And we hear this kind of argument even to this very day where some people who claim to be Christ followers will speak of Jesus' resurrection as being more of symbolic or metaphorical, right? And so it didn't actually happen. It was a, it was a spiritual resurrection. It was a symbolic resurrection. But Paul is very clear here that without the literal resurrection of Jesus, our faith is in vain. The resurrection really is the linchpin of our faith. Our, our hope for eternity is built on the fact that Jesus died and was raised again to new life, defeating the greatest enemy of all, death. So, in this first part, he's reminding them of how many people had post-resurrection encounters with Jesus, right? Peter and the disciples, this is Cephas, it's Peter, the name for Peter, right, the Greek name. Uh, Peter and the disciples, and then there's a story uh, in the Gospels towards the end that talks about how he appeared to hundreds of others at once, and then he mentions James, uh, the brother of Jesus, very specifically. And then, of course, Paul refers to his own encounter when Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus, blinding him, speaking to him, literally hearing the, the voice of Jesus. And notice where Paul places himself on this list. He is the last one mentioned. Now, Partially, I suppose, he could be speaking chronologically. Those other experiences when Jesus appeared to Peter and the Twelve, when he appeared to the hundreds of others, and, and, and so on and so on. And Paul's encounter came after that. So he might be speaking chronologically, but I actually think there is more to it than that. I mean, notice verse 9. Look what he says in verse 9. 
For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Truly, Paul does not see himself as being worthy of being called an apostle. Why? Because of what he did before he came to know Christ. Because of his previous behavior, because of his previous sin. And you know, I think a lot of people struggle with that. Now perhaps not like Paul. Paul saw his, his the way he tried to persecute the church prior to knowing Jesus as the thing that really disqualified him. But for many of us, we might look at uh, our own lives, the mistakes we've made, uh, the sins we've committed, maybe sometimes even the ways that we have denied Christ in the past. And so we too begin to think that we are not worthy, worthy to be saved, worthy to serve Jesus, worthy to call upon the name of Christ. And yet, God did use Paul. In fact, he used Paul in a, an extraordinary way, a very powerful way. And honestly, I'm not sure that God used Paul in spite of his past. I often think that God used Paul because of his past, because of the way he had lived, because of the way he had persecuted Christ's followers before coming to him. Sometimes God can take even our greatest weaknesses and our biggest mistakes and use them in the most powerful ways for His glory. So, don't ever think that you are too far gone for God to use you. He redeems the broken and He uses our experiences for His good. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, I thank you for this important teaching from Paul about the, the place and the importance of the literal resurrection of Jesus. And in that story, he reminds us that he saw himself in such a humble way because of his past and really questioned whether he would even be able to serve God in the way that he did. And some of us may wrestle with the same question. We look at our own sin, our own past, our own denials of Christ, and we wonder if it's even possible for God to use us, to redeem us, to save us. And yet, God is in the business of redeeming the broken and using it for His good and for His glory. May it be so in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everyone, have a wonderful day, and I will talk to you tomorrow. God bless.